James chapter 1, are, are, um, there's a series of verses here that we want to read that uh, should be ingrained and branded in to each and every one of our hearts and minds. These are scriptures that will test trial or infliction. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have a perfect worth that you may be perfect and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. Now notice he said, count it all joy. And the reason you have to count it all joy, as we all found out, is because it's not any fun. <laughs> Tests, trials, and troubles, afflictions, hard places, difficulties are never fun. Nobody ever prays, Lord, give me more difficulties. But you don't have to pray for those because they're going to come whether you think so or not or whether you ask for them or not. God's not the author of difficulties, but he does have a way for us to overcome them. And that... that requirement or that which is required of us is knowledge count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations again in verse 2 verse 3 knowing this knowing this there's something about our knowledge of God the way he operates and in, in my opinion even knowledge of how the devil operates that will bring us to the place where we can count it joy that doesn't mean that it'll ever be fun it doesn't mean it'll ever feel good but there are things that if we know, they can bring us through to victory. Knowing this, what are we supposed to know? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect in entire wanting nothing. I think everybody knows that patience is something we're supposed to have. I wish there was a way we could just buy it. Whatever the cost, it would be worth it. But patience doesn't come by buying it. Patience doesn't come by praying for it. Patience doesn't come by any other means that we could identify other than standing strong, learning to stand strong in times of trouble. Now we get into the argument, or it's easy to get into the argument, I guess. Does God want us to have trouble? Well, he wants us to develop in patience, and patience is only developed through trouble. So I, I guess the most accurate way to answer that is God's not the one making trouble for us, certainly. He doesn't test man with evil. He doesn't tempt man with evil. Neither can he be tempted with evil, James goes on to say. But patience is more important than the feel-good comfort zone situation that we always want to have. So is trouble good for us? In this regard, yeah, it's good for us in that it develops patience. And notice the first thing he says about patience is it comes by being tried or tested, by your faith being tried or, or tested, but it ends in victory every time. Let patience have her perfect work. That word perfect is complete, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, this word perfect, talking about us, is talking about maturity. It's talking about spiritual growth and development. Then he says in verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, it shall be given him. What's that telling us? It's telling us you're not always going to know what to do in the middle of trouble. But when you don't, there's an easy answer. There's an easy fix. Ask God for the wisdom you need in the middle of the trouble. It's, it's the, the easiest thing in the world for us, no matter how long we've been walking with God no matter how dedicated to him and his word and his plan and his purpose no matter how much that may be the truth in our lives there are always going to be situations regarding trouble regarding the testing of your faith the trying of your faith that you're not going to have an answer for now that's the point where some people bail a lot of people give up at the point that they don't know the thing that they don't know or the, the, the steps to take, they may not know. But God's always there with an answer. He's always there to help you. Now, think about what that means. That means he wants you to make it through your trouble successfully, victoriously. That's what he wants. I think sometimes we think we want it more than he does. We're more committed to our situation than he is, but that's not true. If that were true, he wouldn't always have an answer. 
So it says, if any of you lack wisdom, you can't be just talking about normal wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, Christ has made unto us wisdom. Along with some other things. Four different things it says Christ has made unto us. So he's not just talking about wisdom that comes from the word of God. He's talking about wisdom in your specific situation. Thank God both belong to us. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. There's a condition. It shall be given him. Here's the condition. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So it's telling us we're going to have to ask in faith nothing wavering. Now why does he talk about not wavering in this situation? Why does he point out, and, and we have to believe that this is inspired by the Holy Ghost. Why is the Holy Ghost pointing out the need to not waver? Because when you're dealing with things that you don't know, that's where the devil can trip you up. When you're dealing with the unknown, now the unknown in this case is if you lack wisdom, if you don't know what to do next. How many of you ever come to a place where in the middle of your trouble, in the middle of your situation, you just don't know what else to do? Pretty common occurrence, right? Well, what are we to do? Ask for wisdom. Why does it take faith? Because it may not look like you're getting it. It may not look like it's coming to you. It may not look like you have any direction from the Lord to take. I always liked what Brother Hagin used to say. He, used to, he may still say it. I don't know if you say this in heaven or not. But he used to say, I go as much by what God doesn't say as what he does. Well, if we apply that principle to these scriptures, if you ask for wisdom, ask in faith, you may have to stand strong in faith because it may not seem like anything's happening. And if there is nothing that's being told you, that may be an indication from God that there's nothing more for you to do. You remember Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Well, let's turn over there. Let's look at Ephesians 6, 10. Paul's writing to the church, the most famous church in the world, probably the biggest church in the world too. Verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We've talked about this, uh, this phrase, wiles of the devil. The word wiles really means trickery or deceit. And, of course, that's the way the devil operates. But the root word means traveling over. Now, that used to puzzle me. Why would the word for traveling over be used? But I came to understand that he's telling us, Paul's telling us by the Holy Ghost, that there's only one road the devil travels. And that's through deceit. So he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the traveling over, the road that the devil travels, in other words. God wants you to be able to stand against the devil's attacks. Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high or heavenly places. Wherefore, because of this, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand, therefore. And then he talks about the elements of the, the armor of God. But there comes a point in time in many of our situations, if not all of them, where you've done everything that there, there is to do and it's time to just stand still. Now, when it talks about the devil's road and the way that he travels against us, we know that he travels against us in deceit. Well, what does that mean? If we've got the word for what we're in the middle of or the word that covers our situation, if we're asking for something or believing for something or whatever the case might be. You remember the story in the Old Testament about the 10 spies, the 12 spies went into the land of Canaan. 10 of them came back with an evil report. What was their evil report? They came back saying, we can't take the land. So therefore, that tells us, shows us a perfect example that one of the ways the devil will work against you, one of the ways that he operates on the only road that he travels, which is trying to bring deceitfulness or deception to your mind, one of the ways he travels is to tell you, you can't do it. You can't make it. God won't see you through. 
Now, you may have heard great testimonies from somebody else. And thank God they had what it took to get it, but not you. Now, we all know that's the way the devil operates, don't we? We don't think of it so much in those terms, but that's the only thing that he can do. The only thing that he can do is try to get us to waver, speak against what the Word says about us and and what belongs to us, or rather than speaking against the Word, speaking against us and trying to make us believe that we can't do what the Bible says we can't. So count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, tests, trials, and afflictions, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. The trying of the faith that's based on the unseen truth of the Word of God that we can't see any evidence for is what the devil's going to tell you is not working. That's the place where he's going to tell you you can't make it. Others might, but not you. Or that God will not honor his word. I've been uh, doing some study on the, uh, the life of Joseph. Joseph fascinates me. It's hard for me to relate to him because the guy never made a mistake. At least not one that's recorded in the, recorded in the Bible. And the Old Testament is great about telling us where people missed it. The Old Testament is, is terrific about telling us where people blew it and messed up and Stepped out of the will of God and so forth. You can't find that with, Josh, with uh, Joseph. Not once. Well, we all remember the story. How that when uh, the story of Joseph starts in Genesis chapter 37. Tells us that when he was 17 years old, he had a dream. And that dream was the, they were gathering sheaves in from the field. And each one of the, his uh, 11 brothers, there were 12 of them in all. That became the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. His brother's sheaves bowed down before his. Well, he told that to his brothers. I have no idea what would make him think that would be a good thing to do. I mean, they hated the guy anyway. He knew that or should have known that. The Bible makes it clear. But he told his brothers, and they got upset about it. And so what happens? He he has another dream. This time, the stars of the sky that represent his brothers... And the sun and the moon bowed down before him. And the sun and the moon represented his mother and father. And so now everybody's mad at him. Even his father gets upset. Well, his father sends him out. Jacob sends him out to check on his brothers. And when his brothers saw him coming, they hatched this plan to kill him. And one of the brothers talked him out of that. Let's just throw him into a pit. Let's don't have his blood on our hands. And then about that time, a a slave trader of caravan came by. So they sold him into slavery. All because he had a dream. Or two dreams. Really the same dream, but you know what I mean. So they sold him into slavery. One of the brothers said, let's, one of the brothers that came up with the idea to sell him into slavery, said, let's sell him and see what come of his dreams. Well, that starts a long road for Joseph. He gets to Egypt. He's sold under Potiphar's house. Potiphar is the captain of the king's guard. Pharaoh's special army, personal army. And he winds up, the hand of God is on him, which is probably one of the reasons why his brothers hated him so. But the hand of God was on him, and he became the chief person, the ruler of the house in Potiphar's house. It goes so far as to tell us Potiphar didn't even pay any attention to the business of the house or what he had because Joseph was so good in taking care of things and the hand of God was on it. Well, you remember what happened after that. looks like Joseph is doing pretty good. I don't think he had any idea how his dreams might come to pass at that point in time. But he's just minding his own business. And then Potiphar's wife tells a lie on him. Says he tried to assault her. Potiphar listened to his wife, believed his wife, and had him thrown into the prison. The special prison where the enemies of the king were put. Well, it's not too long before Joseph starts running the prison. 
God blesses this guy everywhere he goes. Now, he's in slavery first, and God blesses him. Now he's in prison. He's a prisoner, and God still blesses him. Now, I don't know about you, but I would rather the blessing of God keep me out of prison and slavery. That'd be my way to make this work. But that's not the way it happened. Well, you remember more about the story, I'm sure. The king throws the butler and the baker, the chief butler and the chief baker in prison. They displeased him. And both of those guys had a dream, same night. Joseph asked what's going on. They told him the dream. He interpreted it. He said to the chief butler, three days from now, the king will restore you to your original position. The chief baker hears that and says, well, let me tell you my dream. And Joseph says, three days from now, the king will kill you. Cut your head off. So he says to the butler, it happens just exactly the way that he said that it would, just exactly the way the dreams were interpreted. He tells the butler, remember me when you get before Pharaoh, because I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't done anything wrong. Two years go by. And then Pharaoh has a dream. You remember he dreamed about the, he had two different dreams that meant the same thing. He had one dream where there were seven cattle that were eaten up, big, fat, healthy ones that were eaten up by lean ones, skinny ones. And Joseph interpreted the dream. He said, God gave this dream to you twice to show you how important it is and that it will truly come to pass. And he explained to him about how that the seven years were seven years of plenty and then would be followed by seven years of famine and the famine would be so great that it would be like there never was the seven years of plenty. And so he gives Pharaoh instructions or makes a suggestion to him. He said, find somebody to put in charge of this that will collect a portion of everybody's crops during the, the years of plenty so that you can guard against the years of famine. Well, in a matter of one day's time, Pharaoh exalts and elevates Joseph to be the prime minister. Now, there's a couple of things that happen. The Bible tells us that uh, in Genesis chapter 37 that Joseph is 17 when he has the dreams. It also tells us that he's 30 when he stands before Pharaoh. 13 years, almost half this kid's life. How long would it take you or me to doubt the dreams that we had during that 13-year stretch? Now, I'm sure Joseph had bad days just like you and I might have bad days. I'm sure there were times he probably kicked the walls and said, God, what is going on here? I have done nothing wrong. I've only served you. I've put you first. I did the right thing and didn't sleep with Potiphar's wife. Now look where I am. Nobody wants to be in a bad place, folks. Nobody wants to be in hardship. Nobody wants to be in distress. The story goes a little bit further, and Joseph winds up revealing himself to his brothers and bringing his family down there, down to to Egypt from the land of Canaan, because the famine is in that land too. But there's a couple of things that happen One is during the seven years of plenty, the wife that Pharaoh gave him, apparently she's, um, it was a very influential marriage that was put together. Joseph has two sons. The first son he names Manasseh, which means to forget. And he says this, uh, the Bible says that Joseph named his first son Manasseh because the Lord had made him forget all of his troubles. In other words, he was elevated to such a degree that it overshadowed and wiped out his memory of the trouble, the 13 years of trouble. Then the next next son he has, still during the years of plenty, the seven years of plenty, he names Ephraim, which means double fruitfulness, or we might say double portion. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith work is patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting, lacking, needing 
desiring nothing. Folks, this is the way God operates. One of the things that always frosts me about people, and it's usually denominational churches, and their reliance on the book of Job, the story of Job, nobody ever talks about the end of the book. Nobody talks about the fact that Joseph, that uh, Job came through this situation. Most Bible scholars agree it was a nine-month to 12-month period of time that everything written in Job took place. It's not like it was this way forever. But at the end of that period of time, however long it was, the Bible says God gave Job twice as much as he had to start with. And Job messed up a lot. God didn't bless him with twice as much because Job was perfect. He wasn't. But he never strayed too far. And God gave him twice as much. Well, this seems to be the same pattern that God was operating with, with Joseph. Then you remember his his, uh, brothers come from Canaan land, the famine that's in their land too. And they bow before him and Joseph remembered the dream. Now, it's interesting that it says it this way. It's uh, Genesis 42, 21, I think. But when his brothers come and bow down before him, the Bible specifically says, and he remembered his dream. What do you think he's been doing with those dreams? If he had been trying to live on them, it wouldn't say that he remembered it. Here's one mistake I see people make over and over and over again. They get a dream or a vision for something and they try to make it come to pass themselves. I have an advantage on that because Brother Hagin talked about that to us many, many, many times. He was always big on times of preparation, recognizing the value of preparation times. He was always very strong on letting God work things out. He'd tell a story after story after story about what God would say to him about a meeting or a, a crusade or a campaign or a ministry endeavor and how he never did a thing to make it work he just left it alone if it was God it would work itself out or God would work it out instead and it always worked I think people are trying to live on their dreams and everything you hear is pursue your dream pursue your dream pursue your dream not me I'm going to pursue God let him work things out the way he wants them Because if the dream is of God, he's big enough to make it work. And if the dream's not of God, I don't want to be going in the wrong direction. So his brothers bow down before him. Of course, they don't know who he is. He hasn't revealed himself yet. So they bow down before him. And they don't know that he, he, Joseph, the brothers don't know that Joseph speaks their language. He's hiding himself from them through a variety of means. One is he's speaking to them through an interpreter. So that gives him the advantage to hear and understand everything that they're talking about. And one of the things that got me about this story has always intrigued me is his brothers talked about their guilt for what they did to him. And they said it this way. They said, we are guilty of the blood of our brother. I guess they assume that he's dead. Certainly don't expect him to be in the position he's in, I'm sure. But it says it this way. We heard the anguish of his soul. When he was in the pit. And that's why this distress has come upon us. Now you remember that Joseph kind of played games with them. Undercover. He put their money back in the sacks of grain. That they were supposed to have paid for. So they were afraid about that. And that's kept them away. Then he did the thing with hiding his silver cup. In Benjamin's gear. So he's not, he's not going out of his way. To tell them who he is. Until he's proven them a bit. Part of that proving involved a stand in prison for a few weeks. And then he made some demands on them to bring his younger brother or their younger brother, Benjamin, to him and so forth. But when it says, when uh, I think it's Simeon that makes the comment, we heard the anguish of his soul. That word anguish means extreme distress. It's translated a bunch of different things, tribulations, troubles, and so forth. But it implies, if, if not, comes right out and speaks to it by definition, that Joseph knew that the trouble that was coming for him was going to be severe. 
He agonized during the time that he was in the pit. He knew his brothers were having an argument about whether to kill him or not. I'm sure he felt his life was in danger to some degree anyway. But Simeon said, we heard the anguish of his soul. Now, folks, you know, knowing the end of the story, the thing that Joseph was agonizing about was a step used by God to get him to where he wanted him to be. But those times sure are difficult to identify sometimes, aren't they? When Joseph finally does reveal himself to his brothers, he says this. They, are, of course, are apologizing or trying to apologize for what they did to him. And he said, don't worry about it. Don't fret over this. God used it to save you and the rest of our family. After 13 years in prison, wrongly accused, mistreated, sold into slavery, the whole thing. After 13 years, when he's elevated to the position God had planned for him to have all along. He sees the hand of God in the evil that they did to him. I know a lot of people, and I'm sure you do too, that have gotten bitter with God over things not working out the way they wanted them to and have turned their back, at least to some degree, some completely, but others just to some degree. Because things didn't go the way that they were believing for them to go. Back in uh, the period of time that we were having trouble with uh, our construction and the lawsuits and different things that were going on, um, I was believing God for one thing specifically and it didn't work. It didn't happen that way. I was believing for us to win the, the big lawsuit and not be liable for the money that we really didn't know. But we lost that one. We lost a half a million dollars plus almost another half a million dollars to legal fees. And I, I was, that was one of the low points for me. So I was talking to the Lord about it. God, I know that you're not against us. I know you told us what to do. You know we did what you said. But I sure never expected it to go like this. The Lord said something to me that I never will forget. And here's what he said. He said, Mike, you're trying to micromanage this thing with your faith. And he's right. I was believing to win this. I was believing to gain this. I was believing for this. He said, you're trying to micromanage this thing with your faith. Why don't you just rest and let me work it out? Well, okay. Okay. I would have liked to have had that instruction before the million dollars was, had, was forfeited. Okay. I remember hearing a missionary to Africa talking about trying to talk God into letting him buy certain things because he could make a, 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 either a profit on it or save money on it or whatever it was that he was looking at. And God told him, I didn't send you to here to Africa, to the African continent to save money. I sent you over here to save people. You do what I tell you to do, and I'll work out the finances. And he did. Now, I want you to look with me to a scripture in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 10. You remember that word anguish? Distress, tribulation, troubles. Talking about an extreme difficulty. This word's used in Proverbs 24, 10 as well. It says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. I asked the Lord during the middle of our trouble and financial difficulties and lawsuits and all that other kind of stuff. And really the biggest, the thing that hurt the most for me was not the loss of money. We lost 60% of our people. Folks that just couldn't stand the pressure. Now it wasn't pressure that was being put on from within us. We weren't trying to take off offerings or raise money to do different things or anything like that. We said very little about it, to be honest with you. I only told people what I had to tell to do the right thing. But there's a lot of stuff about it that nobody ever knew. But there was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of pressure coming in from the outside. It was just an attack against our church. 
trying to keep us from getting a, a planting our roots deep in the ground. I asked the Lord during the middle of this, what was all this for, or what is all this for? It was still going on, so it's present tense. I said, Lord, why is all this stuff happening? He said one word to me, preparation. Preparation. Now, if the trying of your faith works patience, like James 1 says, if the trying of your faith works patience, but if you let, learn to let patience have her perfect work, to run its course in you, in other words, you keep your emotions in check and walk in peace, maintain the peace of God during the middle of the trouble. If all those things are necessary or, or key elements to bringing you and I to the place where we're perfect and entire wanting nothing, then that would be preparation, wouldn't it? Every trouble that the devil brings to us that tries our faith that gives us the opportunity to develop patience would therefore have to be preparation. Now I got to thinking about that. Initially I thought, well, this is great, preparation, this is wonderful. Then I got to thinking, wait a minute, does that mean something worse is coming down the road? Does that mean something bigger is on the horizon? I learned to just cast that out of my thought life and just forget, forget about that. But where it says, if you faint the day of adversity, your strength is small. We would have to say the same thing would be true to say if you faint in the day of preparation. That would have to be true. Brother Hagin used to tell us all the time, preparation is not lost time. Preparation is not lost time. So the devil will try to tell you that you can't make it. The devil will try to tell you that you can't finish. He wants to tell you whatever it takes to begin with early on to keep you from stepping out in faith. But once you do step out in faith, he wants you to, to believe. He wants to convince you that you don't have enough to get through. Or that God will do a little bit of what you want but won't make good on the whole thing. Have any of us ever known God to go halfway in anything? When you look at the detail involved in this creation... Stuff that scientists haven't even figured out yet. He seems to be a finisher, doesn't he? I'm sure that we're not the only ones that have made this mistake. As a matter of fact, let me show you an example. Let me show you what Paul did. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Well, I'm calling out the wrong reference. Let me find it. It's 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, let me start in verse 18. It says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went on before thee, that thou by them mightest a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Now he's going to tell us about two guys, of whom, the ones that are shipwrecked in their faith, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Do you see that? That I've turned over to Satan. This has to be a reference to the same thing that Paul was talking about in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where he talks about the guy that's living openly with his stepmother has taken her from his father and living openly in sin. He says, when you're come together, my spirit will be joined together with you to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Here you see another thing. Notice in both of those instances, this one that's identified in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and the one that's identified in the Corinthian letter, the 1 Corinthian letter. Notice that it's Satan that does the destroying of the flesh, not Jesus. Not God. 
that's really important for you to remember. There are times, clearly, that we may have authority to take action for the good of the people, for the, in these cases, for the good of the churches involved. So you see that in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander that I, that I have turned over to Satan, that they may, not, they may learn not to blaspheme. Turn with me over to 2 Timothy chapter 4 now. Here's the second letter that he writes to Timothy. So it has to be, chronologically, it has to be after the first one. Notice what he says, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when you come, bring with you. And the books, but especially the parchments. Those must be notes of everything that Paul has received from the Lord and put down for posterity. Wish we had those parchments now. Now notice verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou aware also, for he has greatly withstood our words. This has got to be the same Alexander that was spoken of in the first letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. So in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, Hymenaeus and Alexander had been turned over to Satan that they might learn not to blaspheme. And here in the second letter, chapter 4, verse 14, Alexander is still around. Now, what does that mean? Now, I'm going to say something loosely here and then clean it up. It means God doesn't kill people as fast as we want him to. Now, here's the exaggeration on that. God doesn't kill anybody. But obviously, it seems obvious to me anyway. You tell me if I'm wrong. But it seems obvious to me that Paul thought the situation was already handled at the time that he wrote the first letter to Timothy. And now when the time comes around for the second letter, he's still here. Could this be a situation where Paul's trying to micromanage something too? It's possible. I think most situations we'd be better off. We'd just trust God for what his word says. And let him work out the details. Don't you think? If you faint in the day of adversity. If you faint in the day of preparation. Your strength is small. Folks trouble is where the. Real believers. Strong believers. Are identified. When we've got a pocket full of money and our bodies are working right, it's easy for everybody to be a strong Christian. But who's going to be strong when times are tough? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have a perfect work. There is an end that patience will bring you to. There is an end. Let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, complete. Wanting nothing, lacking nothing, needing nothing. Fully supplied. But the Bible indicates to us that faith plus patience is the only thing that bring, can bring us to that place. Not just faith by itself, but faith with patience. Paul told that to the, uh, to the Hebrews. He said, you have need of patience that you might receive the promise, the recompense of reward. They were believing in the reward. They were standing in faith where the reward was concerned. But there's a place of victory that only patience can get you to. And it's a complete victory. It's the kind of victory that will make you forget the trouble you are in and will provide you a double portion. God's at least twice as big as you think he is. He's at least twice as good as we imagine. He's at least twice as good. My brethren counted all joy. The issue is expressing joy because of what you know the word says, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, no matter what the forecast is, no matter what the diagnosis no matter what the devil tells you is going to happen or won't happen, God's bigger than all of those. Count it all joy. 
when you fall into diverse temptations. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is true. And because it is, Father, we are able to declare with confidence, boldness, that we believe you. We believe your word is true. And Lord, we don't want to be and refuse to be those people that faint in the day of preparation, that faint or give up in the day of adversity. We choose instead to follow Abraham's example and to be strong in you, looking only under your promise, giving glory to you and being fully persuaded that what you promised you're able also to perform. We'll not let the devil shake us from that truth. You are able to finish. You are able to bring to pass that which we've trusted you for. So we give you glory, Father. We thank you in advance for all that we've trusted you for all that we're standing on. If there's something we need to do, Father, all you have to do is tell us and we'll obey. But if you're not telling us anything to do, then we simply, having done all to stand, stand therefore. Thank you, Father, that your word never fails. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us.